Just indicate that when t goes to t0 in the limits, t minus t0 going to 0, well, that is, I'm going back to the infinitesimal case, how to go back and forth from infinitesimal to finite, finite to infinitesimal. So it goes to i over h bar h, t minus t0. Now, it's not, it, we can denote it as an infinitesimal quantity t, which reproduces the starting point of our construction. And if we were doing perturbation theory, et cetera, stuff like that, then that would be the relevant expression. It's good that we can move from here to there by integrating, and this procedure is called integrate, integration of an infinitesimal one. Infinitesimal to finite requiring the integration, right? And this is taking sort of the infinitesimal limit. So that is the time evolution problem in the Schrodinger picture. Now, let's stop over for a while in the Heisenberg picture. And obviously, this kind of discussion is not relevant in the Heisenberg picture because we don't, states are frozen in time. They do not evolve. Evolu evolving quantities are different. Therefore, we have to put it aside as it's not relevant there. We have to go to what Heisenberg uh, interaction picture or Dirac picture. And there, we also uh, need to consider the evolution problem because we know that both states and observables in evolve, so we'll focus on the observ uh, the states to see what we have as the evolution operator. So we are going to construct the evolution operator for in the interaction picture. That's the point. So let's write the title as the evolution in the interaction picture, or time evolution. Let's uh, remind, re remember the equation of evolution as our starting point. V i t i t i. Okay, let's formulate the problem in a similar manner. This is a first degree equation. Therefore, if we specify this i t at a given point t0. And if this is given, then you can predict the, I, the states in a, a future time following this time, later than this time in much better English, in, in terms of the original. And this will be denoted as t t0 psi of t0 i. The only difference, of course, formal difference between this one and the previous one we have written down in Schrodinger picture is the labels i, indicating that it's in the interaction picture. Well, that's all. Well, but there's a lot of difference, right? <laughs> there we didn't have any sub uh, indices S because if, as it is the default picture, we don't usually use a label for the Schrodinger picture of observables or states. Sometimes we do to be over cautious. And if there is no danger of confusion, we suppress them. So in that equation, we didn't have any S indices. But here we need those indices explicitly. And obviously we can proceed as before, uh, to, uh, to uh, construct the U. However, there are some subtleties here. Uh, the reason is that the, uh, the reason is that, for instance, in the definition of the, uh, the operator, there's H zeros only, but there are Vs to describe the full physics in the Hamiltonian. Therefore, we have to 
be a little more careful in this case as compared to the Schrodinger picture case. So let me proceed and we will do the first of all uh, a rather a, a shortcut trick. I call it a shortcut trick uh, because I could have in principle followed the footsteps of the first procedure. That is, I define some of the physical properties. I go through the physical properties and get the mathematical properties like this is unitary and therefore uh, any number of steps to go to the final, uh, uh, final state is not significant. We can multiply any number of u's to get a full u covering the entire space, etc., etc. And it's unitary, obviously, because norm preservation, if this, if this one is at the starting point, if this is uni normalized, this should stay normalized. Therefore, this is unitary. A unit operator exists corresponding to no evolution case, and any number of intermediate steps lead to the final, the same physical final state. All those things can be listed, and then we can construct an infinitesimal one and integrate following those steps. But this time I will follow a different pathway. And you'll see the point why I have to go through there. The reason is the following. Now let's take this formal solution and substitute it up in that equation. You may say, what do we gain? You'll see what I, what I will gain. So let's substitute that up. So what do I get? I get the following, I h bar, now d by dt, ui t t0 psi of t0 interaction is equal to vi of t ui of T, T0, psi T0 of I. Well, if you want, you can put the bracket in here. Well, anywhere you like. There is no need to put any bracket. But perhaps let me not put any bracket at this moment, and I will do it in the next step. So you, you would normally say that you haven't achieved much, right? This is just the original equation rewritten after the substitution of that formal solution. But this really will give us a lot. What do I mean? Well, this d by dt is going to act on everything in the right-hand side. Here and here, you say, of course not. That doesn't depend on t. It only acts on the first. When it acts only on the first, then this straight derivative is converted into partial derivative because that's a bilocal function. It acts only on the first variable, although in principle there are two variables, so it becomes a partial derivative. So let me write what I mean first. T, T0 divided by dt times psi of T0 interaction. That's the initial one which is given to me uh, as general a state as possible. Right? And what about the right hand side? I can now put that bracket I promised because that, is the, that depends on T, that depends on T, but that doesn't depend on T. So it is a spectator in some sense. So I write it as UI T T0 psi of t0 i. Now let's focus on this equation. What do I see? If we combine everything, if, if I move the right hand side to the left, combine everything in the form of a, let me write it in here. Something acting on psi t0 
pi is equal to zero. I can write it as such, right? This entire equation after collecting everything to the left-hand side. So what does it mean then? Well, as this, is, uh, this was chosen to be arbitrary initial state, if it is not arbitrary, you can even write it in, a, in, a, in the arbitrary form by expanding something in terms of that. Then if it is arbitrary, the only way that this equation is satisfied is to set this equal to zero if it is arbitrary. If it was true only for, for if it was true only for a very specific choice of state, not anything else but that, of course, the, this wouldn't have any meaning. If I choose it among all the possible infinitely many physical states that I can think of, then uh, the only way is that this first bracket, which is that bracket here and minus that bracket there, is to be equal to zero difference. So it gives me the following equation. I h bar d by dt ui. I don't know whether you appreciate these, the, the emphasis I put on the difference between the straight and the partial derivatives. It's so important. So that's the reason why I put that much in emphasis on it. So what is the right hand side? B i t u i t t zero. It's a very nice equation. It said now I obtain a partial differential equation involving the u, my formal u, which carries out the time evolution for me. Well, that's nice. It looks very much like the, the evolution equation itself, right? Look at this one. More or less the same. So whatever state, whatever equation the state itself obey in this picture, the time evolution operator also obeys the same equation. Nice. What are the implications? We'll see the implications. Now I have to complement this with the boundary condition or initial condition. Whichever you choose, you are free to do so. Well, notice that when these two entries are the same, it corresponds to no evolution case, no? Because it acts like an identity operator. Time doesn't move, there is no evolution. If time evolves in the time space and psi evolves in the Hilbert space, if it doesn't move, this doesn't move. If it moves, this moves. Only natural, right? So obviously, if I have any intention of solving this equation to determine the ui, I have to do it with this, together with this initial condition, right? That it is the identity operator when there is no evolution. How do we do that? Let's see how do we do it. Well, we can uh, think of integrating the first equation together with this initial condition. So integrate. This is really integration. And before I was saying, using the terminology of exponentiation as integration, which was formally true, but here this is the ordinary calculus. We integrate. But to integrate this, obviously, you have to say from where to where. You can integrate it from t0. Let me put the intervals from t0 to t. Well, for that, obviously, first of all, I have to change this uh, differential equation into a, a generic variable t prime and integrate between t0 and t. OK, let's do that. i h bar t0 to t dt prime dy dt prime ui t prime t0 is the left-hand side. As promised, I changed the rename the variables entering into the equation. And the right hand side is dt prime from t0 to t, vi t prime, ui t prime t0. Well, nice. 
Well, nice in the following sense. Right hand side is hopeless. It's a complicated right hand side because uh, if you don't specify the potential explicitly, it, you, it has to stay as it is. But the left hand side, you can do many things. The, you know, the initial point is fixed. And the, it is the integral of the e derivative with respect to the first variable. So what you get in the, under the integral sign is the value of ui at the upper limit minus the lower limit. So the left hand side become, becomes, left hand side is i h bar times u i t t zero minus u i t zero t zero. Isn't that nice? You see that was the reason why we have really emphasized on the importance of this initial condition, no evolution case. So this second term is the identity operator. So it leaves us only with the UITT0. If I move that second constant term to the right hand side, let's write that. Let's write the full equation now, left hand side together with the right hand side. So then if I, as promised, move this to the right hand side, I have ui t t0 in the left hand side after also dividing everything by i h bar. And so I have the leading term is what? This identity which moved to the, from the left. And what else? I have this additional piece multiplied by 1 over i h bar or minus i over h bar dt prime t t0 bi bi t prime ui t prime t0. Okay, that's the right hand side. You may say, so what? What we have achieved is converting a differential equation, this equation that is, into an integral equation. Yes, that was the purpose anyway. Because this kind of integral equations are very convenient because they can be solved through the iteration techniques. That's what we are going to do. We'll solve using iteration, iteration procedure. Okay. What do we mean by that? We mean by that, what we mean by that is the following. Notice that this is an integral equation because indeed this is the unknown, that unknown appears in here. That's what makes it an integral equation, not a solution, an equation itself. But the right hand side, the integral involves vi. If there is no vi, as vi is the generator of the time evolution of the states, look at the equation, that's an important. I have to warn you, this argument may be a bit dangerous if we don't remember what the full Hamiltonian is. Full Hamiltonian is a0 plus v. But it's split into two parts so that v is the driver or generators of the time, generator of the time evolution for the state. No v no generate, it's frozen in time. No V, no evolution. No V, no time evolution. Repeating myself because it's important. You say V is not there, but H is there. But H doesn't play any role as far as time evolution for state is concerned. No V, no evolution for the state. No evolution means what? Identity. So zeroth order step in this Iteration is zeroth order, no v, is identity. So I'm going step by step. That's the lowest 
state, lowest uh, order I can think of. Then what? I can take this zeroth order solution to that integral equation, substitute it back from the right hand side, then it means I bring in V once, so that will be a first order iteration. So U first order will be this one, one minus I over H bar dt prime t vi t prime times an i. It's stupid to write it times an i, but that's what I said. Per perhaps I should write it in the following sense. u0, t prime and t0, and that's 1. To get the first order, I feed in the zeroth order. So what, the, what is this? It is 1 minus i over h bar t0 to t dt prime v i t prime. Aha, that's beautiful. Already the result is coming up. So I have a first order expression for the u. These are all, perhaps, I'm sorry, as we are talking about the interaction pictures problem, so i should be always there. So this is an infinitesimal form, sort of, the, as it's the first order of the, the time evolution operator in the interaction picture. And this way of constructing is, as you notice, is quite different than the previous way of constructing the infinitesimal one. Well, you'll see the reason. These, at different time, they do not commute among themselves. So different, uh, we'll see in a moment. So what is the next order in this iteration? The next order will be to take this first order one and feed this one into the full equation here. So first order in, second order out. So let's write that second order. i minus i over h bar t0 to t dt prime vi t prime times, let me, allow me please to use that funny notation. What I write in here is ui, the one, t prime and t zero, correct? This is what I have to write here. But instead of writing two lines, I will allow myself to write it as the expansion there. As I said, it's equal to, Perhaps I can put it in, in under a different color so that you see what I am doing. This, I am saving some time this way. I say this is that, but I also write what that is equal to, minus i over h bar. Now please help me in putting the upper limit of this limit, uh, integral. Yes, because that's the t prime, right? So that makes all that is time ordering come in. So if it is t prime, then what is this expression? If it is t prime, there's an integration variable, dummy variable. So I use a different integration variable, dt double prime, vi t double prime, and I close the bracket. I hope this notation, this shortcut doesn't confuse you. So it is really this thing I introduced. I said it is that formally, but the explicit expression is this. So if I now go ahead and write this a second order expression, so what, let's see what I get. Okay, so here is what I get. U second order is i minus minus i over h bar t t zero d t prime d i t prime plus <coughs> minus i over h bar squared I prefer to write it as such because you'll see I I, I will have a compact notation eventually. So t0 to t dt prime, 
T0 to T prime D dt double prime. That's what I had. So I'm just writing it. Vi T prime Vi T prime Vi T double prime. So that's the second order. So get it, to get the third order expression, I again go back to the original initial integral equation. To get the third in here, I substitute the second. So you can see the, how the algorithm is going. So I can write a general, general result to any order. So I have the full exact expression as an infinite series, right? What is that series now? 1 plus n equals from 1 to infinity minus i over h bar n. So let me not make any labeling error. I don't have to what? T dt1 dt to dtn vi t1 vi t2 vi t to the n this is to tn minus 1 this is to t1 and you see how the time is ordered and this is a time ordered product of the Time ordered product of the potentials in the interaction picture. This is a very beautiful expression, and it is also uh, has a special role in the quantum field theory. It's called the Dyson Wick series expansion. And eventually, in there, we won't need it at this level of the class. You can uh, do some manipulations in this time order product and exponentiate it, exponentiate as a time order exponential to mimic an expression that we have found for the Schrodinger picture expression. Remember, Schrodinger picture expression was beautifully simple. E to the minus I over H bar, full Hamiltonian H times the time difference of this, uh, the interval in question. Of course, it's so aesthetically beautiful that one is inclined, one is tempted to uh, sum that infinite series and write it in the exponential form. But because of the non-commuting nature of the different Vs entering in there, you can only do, at most, a time-ordered product of an exponential, and that's a little beyond the level of this class. But when you go to quantum field theory, eventually you'll see such things, and you'll manipulate them. So this, uh, then, is the exact result, to, because it's infinite series to all orders, but you won't need that. Uh, particularly when we go into time-dependent perturbation theory, if you do the exact solution, of course, you may wish to use this or rather simpler alternatives. But if you are doing time-dependent perturbation theory, which would force us, again, to split the full Hamiltonian into two, A0 and V, that's why we use this Dirac picture. There, the V will be small this time as compared to H0. Not only it will be small, but it will also depend on time explicitly. Therefore, uh, then you won't need that many Vs entering in an expansion. In the first order, notice that U, the time evolution operator, has a very simple expansion. Identity plus something which involves V once. If V is not that small, but uh, intermediately weak, then you may wish to retain the potentials to second order, and that will be the form of the U to that order, and so on. If there is need arises to include the V at the third level, then you may pursue that expansion, write it V once, twice, and three times, etc. 
So that, that's the reason why I'm not going to push this any further and stop at that level and try to see in the remaining 15 minutes, try to relate these two time evolution operators we have developed till now to each other. We have the Schrodinger picture time evolution operator and we have the interaction picture time evolution operator. And can I write them in terms of each other? Obviously it's a, a rather interesting question. What do I do then is to write down the relationship between the two states in two different pictures and see whether I can use that defining relationship to immediately get to this connection. What do I mean is the following. What was the psi t interaction? Psi t interaction was e to the i over h bar h0 t, so this is the thing which I'm trying to find, h0 t psi t of Schrodinger, which connects the Schrodinger picture states to the interaction picture states. That is the relationship, remember, part of the Hamiltonian, not the full Hamiltonian. So how do I proceed from here? There is a simple way to proceed. It is the following. I can write this as u i t t0 psi t0 interaction yet. That is, I go to that t0 a, a further earlier time. Obviously, that's what it is, right? You start from the earlier state, move to a later state through this evolution operator in that picture. You can do the similar in here. You can start with an earlier state in Schrodinger picture, act on it by the time evolution operator, and go to that. Notice that I'm not doing much. What I'm doing is using the definitions. First of all, the connection between two different pictures, then going to that states which I define connection through earlier times. Well, that's it, essentially. You see, I can use those to do the following. Let me leave some space in there so that you can copy freely. So let me rewrite that equation, that expression. What do I have? So you, it is ui t t0 times psi t0 interaction picture. That's the left-hand side. It's simple. What about the right-hand side? Right-hand side has the following form. i over h bar h0 t, yes, times u Schrodinger, u Schrodinger t t0 times psi t0 Schrodinger. Well, you may say, what you have achieved? I achieved quite a lot. If I now relate this to the corresponding, at an earlier time, t0, corresponding Schrodinger picture states, how do I do that? I invert, right? I, I write it in the following manner. e to the i over h bar h0 t0, that is the important difference. Perhaps I have to encircle with that uh, different color so that these are so, so important subtleties. I don't want you to get confused about them. Otherwise everything will be void. So that's That's a T0 there. 
So what do I get then? Look at the left hand side acting on here. Look at the right hand side acting on here. If I choose that particular initial state in the Schrodinger picture as, arbit as the arbitrary, that's among the infinitely many initial possible states, it is one of them. So I collect everything to the left and write, uh, after collecting everything to the left hand side, write this as an equation of this form, arbitrary. I hope you appreciate this arbitrariness business. Not a specific one. If it is just one out of the infinite, the many, if it so happens that it is valid only for the special state that it doesn't have any predictive power. If for any initial state you choose arbitrarily this equation holds, then you get the following. Ui t t0 times e to the i over h bar h0 t0 in the left hand side becomes equal to this in the right hand side. i over h bar h0 t now us t t0. Beautiful, isn't it? Well, you may say not yet. Well, it provided that I multiply everything from right by the inverse of this so that it is moved to the right. Now, eventually, I indeed get a beautiful result. U t t0 is equal to e to the i over h bar h0 t, the first vector there, times us t t0 sandwiched times e to the minus i over h bar h0 t0. Here is the beautiful expre expression I promised to get for you. Why I call it beautiful? I call it beautiful for the following reason. Look at this expression, this infinite series expansion. That's ui, right? Well, obviously, before you introduce that time-ordered exponential, which we are not going to do in here because we are not prepared for this. It's a, it requires some beautiful mathematics. Higher order BCH expansions. But here, well, this one is, this one is simple, right? It is an exponential. So it's not a single exponential, but it's the product of two, three exponentials. Isn't that beautiful? That's what I mean. So let me write the result in that fashion so that you can appreciate it. So if I write the explicit expression for that, then ui, ui t t0 becomes e to the i over h bar h0 t there times us Schrodinger picture time evolution operator. We already has seen that it is this beautifully simple expression times e to the minus i over h bar h0 t0. That's it. Not a single exponential, but it's the product of three simple, beautiful exponentials. But that's the best we can do. We cannot move them around. Why? They do not commute. What do I mean by that? For instance, what is this? It is h0 plus v. Can I split this into two and kill the first exponential with the, well, combine it with the, or kill it with the left one? No, because h0 and v do not, doesn't commute. That these are general operators. There's no way. Warning. You see how beautiful the physics and mathematics inter intermingle is. We have no idea why they should commute at all. They are arbitrary. And even you cannot hope to get some simple lower order commutators. For example, a simpler version of BCH, Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. Probably you have seen it five or seven. I don't know. I hope you have. Then, for example, uh, there, there may be special cases for certain operators. Like A and B doesn't commute, but A commutes with the commutator of A and B. 
Then the infinite series stop at some point, so you can write e to the a operator times e to the b operator is equal to e to the a plus b operator times an additional exponential. If that simple thing happens, it may not happen at the first order, it may happen at the second order, like a doesn't commute with b, a doesn't commute with a b commutator, but it may com commute with the double commutator, then there are again some simple expressions. But here, before specifying the explicit form of v and the others, we cannot do much, so this is as it is. This is the final form. But again, beautiful, as I said, the product of two, three exponentials is a very profound expression. It's compared to that infinite series, which is really ugly by anybody's standards, right? So that, oh, no, I, I have one more thing to do before leaving that subject. Now, consider the, consider the expectation values values in eigenstates Eigen states of H0. Why that will be relevant? Well, that will be relevant for our future discussion if H0, for the final discussion, H0 is a time independent part. If you turn on a time dependent V along the way, if you would like to see how the eigenvalues and eigenstate of the original H0 are affected by the turning of this new time-dependent potential, then you have to know the expressions in the original eigenstates of H0. So that's the reason why this is a very physically relevant uh, discussion. So let me proceed. Let me consider those eigenvalues of H0, define it in the following manner, En, N. Okay, here is the definition of eigenvalue problem. Then you can consider the n ui t t0 n. Or can I get as general as possible? Yeah, even I can do it as general as possible. m. Okay. Not the diagonal ones, but as general as possible. So n, let's write that. e to the i over h bar h0 t us t t0 e to the minus i over h bar h0 t0. Notice the difference. t in here, t0 in here. That's by local expressions I'm talking about. Therefore, this difference is important. Well, h0 is Hermitian. It acts to the left and gets, this becomes en, and h0x to the right, this becomes em. These are numbers, they come out. e to the i over h bar, en t minus em t0. You see, that's such an important difference. en goes with t, em goes with t0, times n us T, T0, and here is the beautiful expression. Notice that the expectation values of the time evolution operator in the interaction picture in the left, in the Schrodinger picture in the right, are proportional to each other up to a phase. You're beautiful, isn't it? They are more or less the same up to a phase. Phase has modulus one. If I now take the mod square, eventually you'll see the physical meaning of those mod squares. What do I get? N, N, U, I, T, T zero, M mod squared is equal to N, U S T T zero M mod squared. That's a beautiful relationship. When you consider this in the eigenstates of the H zero, the mod square of these operators are the same. 
So what does it mean? It means even in this respect, in the time evolution problem, you are free to choose any picture you like. At the probabilistic level, you will get the same kind of expressions for these. And you know, these will, be, these will have the meaning of perturbative coefficients eventually at the perturbation theory. So it, it shows how this, these things at the probabilistic level are insensitive to the picture we use. So that completes my discussion on the pictures. Then next hour after the break, we will start discussing the time-dependent potentials explicitly, and it will lead us to the time-dependent perturbation theory. It's a good point to stop, I guess, yes.